It's a privilege to be back. Uh, man, I love preaching. I love opening the Word of God. I love uh, all things when it comes to the Bible, just about. Uh, I, I need to show you a couple of pictures just to remind you of what we're doing in Udon Thani, Thailand. Uh, so if you think of Thailand as kind of like this, oh, hey, guys. So good to see you. Sorry, some old faces, it's going to happen a lot. Uh, if you think of Thailand as like this big hand with this long tongue off the edge, Bangkok is like the, the big magnet that everybody moves to. Uh, we're kind of up in like rural Thailand. Um, and when the board of our international school in Bangkok was praying, Lord, we want to know where you want us to open a second school, they had several different options. And when uh, the option for... Uh, when the time for voting came, they all voted, and uh, secret ballots, and all of them voted for Udantane, uh, which was just amazing. Everybody was crying, and we felt like, God, you want us to come to Udantane as well, and we didn't have a job, but we moved there. And so we are, uh, my wife and I, at an international English-speaking Christian school, kindergarten through 12th grade in rural Thailand. And Thai rich Thai people, pay a lot of money to go to our school and pay us a salary. So we're not missionaries in the sense that uh, you guys are giving us money, you're praying for us. And quite honestly, as you hear my message, what we need more than anything is your prayers. Um, so this is uh, my church. Uh, this is where we worship every Sunday. Um, our Thai pastor is there on the floor in the suit. Um, this is during one of our celebration gift days where we bring rice and uh, food to the church so that we have enough to eat every week after church. Um, and then you see a lot of different kinds of people there, uh, several missionaries who are part of our congregation as well. Um, this is the missionary community in Udantane. When we moved, uh, there was maybe two missionary families there. Um, but since opening the international school, uh, allowing English-speaking missionaries to move to the area and send their kids to school and do missions work. Uh, we've grown to over 23 families, 20-something families. Um, and so this is just a small representation of that growing community. Um, this is our core group at the school. This is all the staff and families at the school. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about this picture. This is the last picture we took with our administrator uh, who has resigned and he is uh, moving to a different country. Uh, so as you think about us, think about this picture. This is our school, kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, we're giving them the gospel every week in different ways. Um, most of these people are Buddhists, um, not the teachers. The teachers are all Christians, but most of the students are coming from Buddhist families. And uh, that's kind of our weekly ministry that we're doing most of the most of our energy. Um, I'm going to flip back to here. Well, I'll leave it on here so you can kind of look at that. Um, we're going to be in Matthew 16 today, but I wonder how many of you have ever lied on a legal document before? Okay. Okay, I got three words for you. Terms and conditions. Oh, some of you got it now, right? Okay, you ever been scrolling through, you want to sign up for something online, and there's this box that pops up that says, accept. And sometimes they get you and they say, I have read and accept the terms and conditions here, right? And maybe you're a better person than I am, and you actually read through all the legalese, and you clicked check, but probably <laughs> you signed up for something, and you have no idea what you just checked. You're trusting that other people are reading it. You, you might have seen memes of people like, I read those fine prints so you don't have to. Right, because none of us actually do. We don't read the fine print. Um, and people have gotten into, people have lost and won lawsuits because they checked a box, for real. So consider one of the most significant commitments you've made in your life. I'm not talking about your house payment or your car or your marriage. Your decision to follow Jesus Christ was a big deal, right? You signed up for something that it wasn't fine print, but 
Hopefully the people that led you to the Lord, that guided you to the path of choosing to follow Jesus, didn't leave all of the fine print, if you will, in the background, but they told you what it would cost you to follow Jesus. Now, the good news is very simple, right? What's the good news? You guys know? You have to believe in Jesus, turn from your sin, okay? We can simplify just to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But Jesus makes it very clear that following Jesus is simple, but it carries a lot of weight. It changes your heart. It digs down deep into your soul. It takes surrender to God's authority in your life. So, as we open the word together today, I want you to look at Jesus' admonition to us about the cost of discipleship. Specifically how it relates to global missions in my context. The terms and conditions, if you will, of being a Christian. So what is it going to cost you to follow Jesus? What does it cost to take God's what, is it, what will it cost God's people to take the gospel to the ends of the earth? What are we going to have to sacrifice so that every tribe and tongue and nation hears that Jesus Christ is Lord? So let me read Matthew 16. We're going to start in verse 21. I'm going to pause kind of throughout the reading um, to kind of rephrase it, but then I'll just kind of keep clipping along. So hopefully you can stay with me here. This is Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. Heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get away from me. You are a hindrance to me, a dangerous trap. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You're not seeing things from a merely, you're, th you're seeing things from a merely human point of view, not from God's viewpoint. Verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself or give up his own way, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would hang on to his life or save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. He will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but gives up or forfeits his own soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? What's worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done truly. I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then, six days later, Jesus is transfigured before them and shines brightly on the mount. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, you are glorious, infinitely beyond our imagination or comprehension. The breath in our lungs, the sight in our eyes, the strength in our bodies is a gift from you. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would fill us full of your spirit. We thank you for becoming human, identifying with us, and sending Jesus. And we pray that your glory would fill our sight. That we would be in awe of being chosen to follow you. And that we would commit with all of our hearts to worshiping you. 
Come quickly, we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So what will it cost to reach the unreached people of the world? Uh, it, it will cost everything, not because reaching the unreached people takes incredible time and resources. There's a reason they're unreached, because they're hard to reach. But it demands all of Jesus' disciples something. Demands something from everybody. So here's the big idea I'm going to try to get across to you today. The glory of Jesus causes all true believers all true followers of Christ, to give up their own way and follow Jesus even to the ends of the earth. Okay? The glory of Jesus causes all true followers of Jesus to give up their own way and follow Jesus to the ends of the earth. Now look at verse 24 of this passage and tell me, what do you have to do to follow Jesus? If you want to be my follower, you must do what? You, you've got a Bible, right? I won't do this throughout the whole message, just a couple times. Okay? Jesus asks you to do what? If you want to be my follower, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. Okay, so it's not hard, uh, but, you know, there's a reason we don't say following Jesus is right and best and easy. Following Jesus is right and best and full of riches and wealth and happiness. Okay, following Jesus is right and best and costs you nothing on this planet. We don't say it. We know following Jesus is right and best, but it's hard. In one way or another, you know that following Jesus is not going to be easy. You're going to have to give up some things, say yes to some things you kind of don't like, and say no to some things you kind of want to do. Now, we're probably never going to have to suffer like these people suffered. I, I doubt any of us are going to be martyred for our faith. Maybe. But probably not. But it doesn't mean that we don't suffer. We're all suffering. Some of you, even now, you're suffering in different ways. So let's talk through the passage and see if the weight of Jesus' words will call us into surrender and suffering for him. If the glory of Jesus shines so brightly that the suffering and the stuff of this world just gets smaller. So if we look back at the previous section, we're going to see that following Jesus, followers of Jesus, I'm sorry, will see God do amazing things. Okay, followers of Jesus will see God do amazing things. And sometimes it's really exciting. It's thrilling to follow Jesus. We see him working in great ways. People are being saved. People are being baptized. The church is replacing the carpet, updating the background. Okay, life is good. You've got church people that are getting along and supporting each other, carrying each other's burdens. And this is the kind of excitement that was going on in Matthew 16. Okay, if you flip back to uh, verse 20. Look at what Jesus tells his disciples not to do. You can read this one too. This is the last time. Okay, what does Jesus tell his disciples not to do? Don't tell anyone I'm the Christ. Okay, now what has Jesus just done? Do you see just slightly before? Jesus has just asked Peter, well, he's just asked his disciples the famous question. Who do people say that I am? And they're like, oh, Elijah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist. And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter's like, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Woo! Like, you are it, Jesus. We've been waiting our whole lives for you, our whole people group. Everybody's been waiting for you, Jesus. seems unstoppable. It seems that there's no way death can affect this superhuman. He is God incarnate. There's no way that 
that anything can stop this being. So we're following him. We're going to follow you wherever. And he's like, who do you think I am? And he's like, the Christ. And he's like, shh, don't tell anybody. And they're like, okay, okay. It's going to be fine. We'll stockpile the swords. It's going to be sneak attack. You know, this is, this is the son of David here we're talking about, right? Great king. This is the son of Moses. It's going to be a great prophet of God. Like, here we go, Jesus. Let's bring it on. We'll be quiet for now, but we cannot wait for you to. And Jesus is like, oh, by the way, I'm going to suffer. From the religious people. And I'm going to die. And I'm going to be raised again in three days. And, and think about this. You've got all of this energy of Jesus healing people. And all the disciples, they're like coordinating lines. They're like lining up sick people to be healed by this Messiah. And he's like, I'm going to suffer. And they're like, no, you're not. <laughs> We're behind you, Jesus, and you can do anything. There's no way you are going to suffer and die. Because they're watching this amazing thing take place. And he says, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ. Now, let me wrap in my experience here in Udantani. Okay, When we moved to Udantani, uh, we, we prayed that God would help us. Um, it was one of the hardest years of my life, honestly. Uh, like three hardest when I was in middle school, when my daughter was born. And uh, love you, Sophie, wherever you are. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and then this first year we moved to Thailand where I lost my job. There's culture shock of like no friends around me. COVID hits, wasn't great. But like as soon as I started teaching, like the joy returned, and there's so much exciting things happening. We're, we're, we're hoping for 75 students to start this school, and we get 150 year one during COVID. Like, uh, God's opening doors with all the licenses and permits and all the relationships we needed to open a school. God did that. Uh, it's a K through 12 Christian school in one of the most remote and Buddhist part of the country. Only 1%, less than 1% of the people in Thailand are Christian. And that includes Catholics. But life is exciting and beautiful. And week after week, we see God working. There's no question in our minds that God's called us to Udon. Uh, we see missionary families on the verge of burnout out in the villages move to Udon so their families can come to the school. They continue to heal. And they're continuing doing ministry. Just before uh, we came to, to America, um, a missionary wife I was talking to said, like, of how much, how thankful she is for the school. And she said, before we move to Udon, uh, if you kind of think about our life in three colors, red being like burnout, like we can't survive, orange being like we're just stressed all the time, and then green being like, okay, this is a sustainable pace. She's like, we were just vacillating between orange and red our whole first term. Like, we are not going to make it. But she said, since coming here and the community and the stability of the school, we're just cruising in green, she said. And her husband just ran like this uh, church, uh, the, this region-wide prayer meeting for several churches in a nearby city. Um, and that prayer meeting wouldn't have happened without that family. And without their uh, improvement in mental health. We see churches being strengthened. New churches being planted. Uh, and just let you know, we're not doing all of this. Okay, I'm, my ministry is the school. But because of the connections that we have, we're really supporting missionaries doing their work. Um, so our church, the church that you saw up there, uh, is already planting several small groups. One already has a pastor in a nearby village. Uh, one of the missionaries at our church has started a youth group where over 20 teens, Buddhist and missionary teens, are coming to this youth group every week. Uh, we've helped donate and build three churches uh, that have outgrown their space in Udantani. And for our school, we're seeing students choose the Bible. Okay? Every year we give our third graders a Bible, but their parents have to sign off to accept it. Okay, this year, as usual, one of the parents said, I don't want you to own a Bible. But the student's like, I really want to own a Bible, and like kept 
begging their parents to like let them please have a Bible. So then finally they signed off and like now every single one of our third graders, Buddhist and non-Buddhist, has a Bible in their home. Uh, a student in one of my Bible classes uh, at the beginning of, well, it was a Buddhist student really, um, and, and I try to be very gracious to our Buddhist students and be sensitive that they have to sit through these required Bible classes and these required chapels. And uh, I said, look, uh, what do you guys think about this message? You've heard the story, Genesis, all the way through Revelation. You've studied it. You've had to retell it. What do you think about it? And one of my Buddhist students said, I think it's true. It makes sense of the world. Like, I think God really did become human and offers a way to save us. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I don't know if you're a believer yet, but like the door for the gospel is wide open for him and his heart. Uh, there's a missionary kid in one of my classes that has been coming to our school for several years. And when he came in, I said, you know, where are you at with the gospel? Like your parents are here in Thailand serving as missionaries. And he's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't really buy it yet. Like, and then this year at the end, in the same class, the, the creation to redemption um he gets up at the end of the class and just says to his classmates like i believe this is true like i'm a follower of jesus i don't understand everything about this bible and this story but like i'm a christian and like seeing the gospel change hearts change buddhist hearts change christians or potential christians hearts and christian families uh has been like me as a disciple watching jesus do this like I get to be involved, and that's what it feels like. I just get to be there while Jesus, like, changes hearts. And so we're watching this, and we, I could go on and on and on, but we're confident. And you can imagine, like, as a school, we're just watching God do this, and we're, like, we're serving the king of kings. Yes! We are, we are worshiping the God of gods who can come into the heart of the most Buddhist, one of the most Buddhist nations in the world, and open a Christian school. Like, God does that. So you can imagine how the disciples felt. Okay, when Jesus is like, you are the Christ. And he's like, don't tell anybody. They're like, okay, secret for now. And he's like, I'm going to suffer. And they're like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Jesus, not you. You can't suffer because you're doing great things. And great things mean no bad things, right, Jesus? When Peter says in verse 22... Lord, this is never going to happen to you. It reflects what happens in our own hearts. Okay, so for the first point was that followers of Jesus see God do amazing things. My second part is that people often assume that followers of Jesus will avoid the sufferings of life. But if I follow the God of the universe, I won't suffer. People often assume that following Jesus avoids the suffering in life, but when you're on the wave of excitement and adrenaline, you just assume bad things won't come, bad things won't happen, at least they shouldn't happen because we're following the Christ. But do you notice what Jesus calls that mindset? When Peter said, suffering is not your path, Jesus, it's not our path, what does Jesus call that? Verse 23, he calls it a lie of Satan. This is not the things of God. The mindset of God is not to avoid suffering, but to go through suffering. So consider our story moving to Thailand. Uh, Amy and I were considering going to Cambodia. Uh, Jeremy and Bonnie Ruth Farmer some of our dear friends were there. Um, and on the way to Cambodia, we stopped at Bangkok, at ICS International Community School, Bangkok, the mother school of my school. And they told us about this new plant they were doing in Udon Thani, and we just couldn't get it out of our minds. So I went back, got my master's degree. We raised enough money to live and learn the language for a year. And uh, we made it. We got there, but as soon as we arrived, uh, COVID hits, 
and the 30 teachers that were hired to teach couldn't get in the country. And we thought, okay, we knew this was going to be hard, but, you know, God's in it. So much of our staff is struggling in the country. The school goes online. The natural flow of what was going to be a building community is shut down completely. We know this will be hard, but God's in it. Okay? The international church that we expected to support our staff uh, needs support and isn't able to offer much support for us. And enrollment soars to over 200, and we keep working with the same skeleton crew, and most of us are wearing multiple hats, and we're like, okay, we know God is in this. It's, we knew it was going to be hard, but we know God's in this, and teachers begin burning out. They start to look to other teachers and just find more burnout. And the support structures that would normally naturally exist in an American context, spiritual, emotional, even physical, they just don't exist in Udantani. So there's no solid churches, no counseling resources, just a tiny missionary community struggling, many coming to Udon to heal. And we're like, what, what are we doing? God, are you in this? Okay, but more than 23 missionary families come and five babies are born to our staff. And we're like, okay, we knew this was going to be hard, but God's in it. But then we have even deeper burnout, mental breakdowns, uh, multiple trips to the hospital, emergency trips back to home countries, multiple families leaving, and teachers unable to finish their contracts because they, the stress and the pressure is just too much. They can't take it. And we say, God, we, we think you're in this, but we didn't know it was going to be this hard. So when you say, I want to follow Jesus, and I'm committing to be a follower of Jesus, remember that you give up your life. You surrender, and you're ready to suffer for the sake of Jesus. And you don't always get a time limit on it. We can suffer a lot for a very short time, but it's the unknowing how long, O oh Lord, will you delay? So what is it going to take to reach the unreached? Uh, what is it going to take to reach Udantani? It's going to take years. It's going to take hundreds of missionaries, many generations faithfully serving in the gospel. Okay, this, this past year, uh, my friend, my dear friend's marriage, you saw a picture of him, uh, under the immense stress of the school and the culture and everything, uh, his marriage just crumbled. And so they resigned, and they're moving it to another, another country. And if we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, I want to follow you, but what is it going to cost me? How hard is it going to be? You, you know the answer. What does Jesus tell you it's going to cost you? It's just one thing, right? It only costs you one thing. It's everything. He, he demands everything, verse 25. So you may think, you know, God's called me here. He's called me to live comfortably here. He hasn't called me to missions. He may not call you to missions, but I pray that you're not saying, I could never do missions because I couldn't give up, well, fill in the blank. Okay, I just talked to somebody this week who said, oh, my, my kid could never be a missionary because he's a very picky eater. Mm, don't say that, please. <laughs> okay. You can always find a way to eat. Uh, you can always find a way to sleep. It is hard. It will be hard. But I pray you're not saying, I couldn't live that far from my family. My parents would never let me go. I, I couldn't live without my favorite foods, my comfortable bed, 
my nice house, my car, fast internet, my close friends, my church, my favorite stores. I, I need to be near my grandchildren. I need to be near my children. I'm prepping them early and often that they stay close to home, that no one should ever move away. Don't let these things be so glorious in your eyes that you forget the glory of Christ. Don't let the gifts be more glorious than the giver. Don't let the joy of family and the stability of your life and the comforts that you experience here be more wonderful and joyous to you than giving everything to follow Jesus. Now, if this is striking you and hitting you, please don't be motivated by guilt to do these things. Don't be motivated by guilt to give up everything for Jesus. Okay? You need to see Jesus as infinitely awesome as he truly is. Because when the infinite glory of our creator fills our vision, then it begins to pour out in our actions. And we're motivated to share Christ's love with those around us. So what is it going to cost to reach the unreached, you've got to give up everything. You've got to give up everything to follow Jesus. Okay? Because if what Jesus is saying here is true, that if you don't give up your life for Jesus' sake, you lose it for eternity. If it makes you squirm, like, ooh, I don't, I don't really like all of that. You've got a better, clearer picture of how the disciples felt about this. That this long-awaited Messiah comes and tells them to suffer and die. So what is it for you? Imagine you're the rich man. You really want to spend eternity with God. You go to Jesus and you say, Jesus, how do I get to eternal life? And he says, follow the law. And you say, yeah, 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 I've got that. And he says, okay, give up. And I bet, if you're like me, it wouldn't be everything. He tells him to sell everything and give it to the poor and come follow him. I bet Jesus would only have to say, sell your extra boat. Or I don't know what it is. Sell your car. Move away from your family. Give up your phone. Really, Jesus, I, I think... Because Jesus did have a lot of followers who wanted to follow him. And then when he started saying stuff like this, they're like, yeah, you know what? Now that, I, now that I hear it out loud, it sounds a little different. I don't think you're really the Messiah because the real Messiah is just supposed to snap his fingers and fix stuff instead of draw us into suffering with him. So I implore you in the words of Jesus to give up your own way and follow him. Be ready in a moment to, to be drawn into deeper sacrifice, whatever that looks like for you. Okay? It, it may not take you to Udantane. I hope it does. I'd love to have some of you there. But it does mean that you're getting ready. You're looking for opportunities now. You're looking for opportunities to do mission work with your family, to give missions, to give to missions with your family, to prepare your kids to do mission work. To be planting seeds. Okay, when I was uh, nine years old, I remember listening to a missionary speaker and being like, that's what I'm going to do when I get bigger. I'm going to go be a missionary somewhere, somewhere in the world. And my parents would be like, if you guys want to do mission work, we'll come visit you. Just go follow Jesus wherever, you, wherever he takes you. I can't tell you how many times I think about that. Like how hard it is for my parents to not see their grandbabies. Now, Facebook has shrunk the world quite a lot. You've got social media connecting people, but it's not just your sacrifice. Your whole family has to sacrifice. You all have to commit to following Jesus. And you say, well, I'm not really a preacher. You know what Thailand needs? Christians. We need doctors and lawyers and we need artists and counselors. Oh, we need counselors. We need therapists. We need tutors to come. We have a friend who recently moved to our city. 
And you know what he's doing? He's selling chicken. <laughs> he started a chicken truck to, to provide jobs for ties and to be involved in his local church. So he's faithfully plugging into his church on Sunday and selling chicken all the other days of the week. So for us, what do we need, the Michelex? We need prayer. We need you to follow us on Facebook. Unfortunately, that's all we're doing right now. We're trying to expand out to email. So if you want to email instead of a Facebook uh, on our prayer card that you have, you can email us and say, sign me up. And I will figure out a way to do so. But I can't tell you how much prayer impacts us. I never really believed it. Like, I, I believed it. But when we moved to Udantani and then we started sending out prayer updates, it was like life is like in the pits. And I'm like discouraged and, and run down. I'm like, oh, I got to do this prayer letter, da 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 sent. And like within 24 hours, it's like, whoop. Oh, I guess I should have sent that when we started having this problem instead of waiting a week and a half. Okay, because God answers prayer. He really does. We see him working all the time. And we need your prayers you, we, I need your prayers from my own heart. That I, I need the word and feast on Jesus. We need prayers for our school and our mental health and just the stress of this world and the stress of a dark city that we'd be able to survive and thrive together. Pray that God would raise up the next generation to be missionaries in Udantani. And you're looking at me and you're like, you're not even 40 yet. I know, I'm getting close to 40, okay? But I will spend, God willing, my life in Udantani and the work will be unfinished and most of the city will be unreached. Christianity has been in Thailand for 200 years. We're not making a big dent. The, the devil has his clutches wrapped around the throats of the people. And we need you to pray and to send and to come. Jesus may have called you to go. Maybe not. He called you to pray for sure. But following Jesus will cost you something. It, it, it's not going to cost you everything. I mean, like... I wrote this sermon on my iPad sitting in front of my air conditioner on my recliner. Okay, so when you think like, wow, they're really suffering. Ah, okay, we get pizza every week. Like, my kids love Thai food. When it's not spicy. Okay, we watch, we, we watch family movies on a huge TV in my living room. Uh, I love my job. I love teaching music and Bible. And this next year, uh, because our principals resigned, I'm stepping into the role of principal. And I've already started doing it, and I already love it. So I'm not being called by God to drag my knuckles on the ground and, and eat bugs every day and, and sit under a leaky roof. God calls us to different places. And part of the reason we didn't move to Cambodia is because we're like, we're not quite ready to live here. But then we moved to Udon and we're like, this is perfect for us. Perfect pace for our family. Perfect situation. The, the amenities that it has for our family is, is perfect. And so for us, we see a very sustainable pace for us in Udon Tani. Hard, hard, really hard, but sustainable. But even for us, we've got to pray to God. Like, God, these are the gifts that you've given me. So they're yours. And we're just giving up our life to you. And wherever you call us, wherever you send us, we're ready to go. We're ready to give up and go. So maybe you feel like God's calling you. Maybe you feel like God's speaking to you. You can ignore my voice. Just let Jesus' voice speak to you. And if the little voice inside your head says, heaven forbid I should ever give that up. Heaven forbid I should ever suffer for Jesus. He wants me to be comfortable and happy. You can speak back to that little voice and say, get behind me, Satan. You might have to shout it sometimes. Okay, that lie of you can't do it, you couldn't give it up. 
You can. You can sacrifice for Jesus, but not because you're guilty. Because Jesus is glorious. He is worth every sacrifice you could possibly make. And you don't sacrifice in your own power. You sacrifice in the power of the Spirit. So parents, encourage your kids to consider missions. Encourage them to leave America. Strategize now. This passage doesn't really talk about mission strategy, but there's a strategy to missions. Okay, Moving an international English-speaking school in the heart of an unreached city in Thailand was a strategic move for missions to bring missionaries and support missionaries so they can be doing more work. Part of the reason we haven't burned out is because we've got great deep resourcing benches of prayer partners, of training. Uh, I went to a Christian school growing up. We had so many great pastors pouring into us as kids. Went to a Christian college, more, par- more people pouring into us. Got great training from Morningstar Church and from uh, Red Brick Church. Chris Braun's pouring into me and training me. It took years. When we moved to the Rockford area, we thought like, okay, we got to do missions. We got to do missions. We didn't realize how much we needed the church to pour into us. And how much we needed to pour into the church to upskill ourselves so that we're ready for the, the, the ministry in Udon Thani. So plug in, lean in to the church. Wherever you are, serve now, learn now, grow, grow now so that when you find yourself, like we did, where there's like no more people to keep pouring into you, then you're ready to pour out to others. Don't let guilt be your motivation because it's guilt is not enough to change generations of your family's culture. Guilt is not enough for you to actually give more than you want. Guilt is not enough knowing that 1,500 Thai people are dying every day and spending eternity away from God. Guilt is not enough for you to change your prayer life so that you really deeply pray. Guilt is not enough for you to give up the the American dream of materialism and getting all the stuff. These things can motivate you. Guilt can motivate you, but it shouldn't be the primary motivator. What needs to be your primary motivation? To change, to sacrifice. glory of Jesus, your Messiah, should motivate you to give up everything. So, Christian, don't be the kind of Christian that uh, clicked, I agree to follow Jesus without really considering that you've got to give up everything to follow this guy, but it will be so much more glorious. So you're going to see God do amazing things, but he's going to call you to suffer. But the glory of Jesus causes all true believers to give up their own way and follow Jesus even to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you and we worship you, not like we ought. We feel like Peter sometimes, that we can, we can shout it really loud that you are the Christ, but God, when it comes to really giving up, all of us, even me, God, all of us struggle. We struggle with the gifts. And we value and worship and get so distracted by the stuff that we forget that we're living for eternity. So I pray that you would call some in this place to go. Call some to come visit us and encourage us. Call some to to learn Thai. That this church would grow and encourage each other and build each other up. Bear each other's burdens and fulfill the Great Commission here in this city. Because Jesus, it's all about you.
it's all about you, and I pray that you would give us vision in our eyes to see it, to shut out the dark voices and to listen to the Spirit, that you are coming soon, and that every minute we work for you is a minute saved for eternity. We can't wait to see you, Lord Jesus, so come back as you've promised, even today, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.